but I noticed like, hey, there's a global client who wants to get uh, software done in the form of like mobile apps or like websites and all that kind of stuff. But in, in Indonesia, there's a lot of young talents who are smart, but they don't have like the training. So we realize we built this agency such that it trains young Indonesian talents to be Silicon Valley great because of uh, our teaching and our mentorship. And we uh, solve clients from United States, Canada, Australia. Let's go. Can you hear me? Hey, Risky. How's it going? Good, good, good. How are you? Doing good. Happy Monday. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Monday. I don't know. I'm, I'm actually excited on Mondays. I don't know. Oh, really? Popular opinion. <laughs> oh, what? <laughs> you, don't, you don't get the uh, Sunday blues? No, no. I don't know. I like I like Mondays because uh, it's... Uh, it's time to be productive, you know. Everyone's back at work. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Wish I could feel that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. That said, um, been wanting to have you on the pod for a really long time. Um, I think you're probably like one of the uh, smartest people I know. I mean, I don't Thank have you. any other friends <laughs> who do PhDs <laughs> except for you. <laughs> Come in. Coming from you, I'm flattered. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So um, for the uh, audience who don't know you, um, can you tell us about yourself, man? Yeah. So um, I guess I could start simple. Um, I'm Mohamed Rizki Welianto. I go by Rizki. I am finishing my PhD in computer science at University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. It's uh, it's my third year, and yeah, I'm also a founder of an Indo-based uh, dev agency called TKA.co.id that builds software for clients across the globe. I could go into any of these, but feel free to uh, yeah, if you have any if you have questions. Absolutely. Um, okay, let's say I'm like a college student or maybe a high school mm -hmm. student, and I don't yeah. know what a PhD program is. Tell me about that. Yeah, so a PhD program, I think if I have to, I could go a little bit more uh, deep, but I think if I would uh, boil it down to one sentence, it would be, a PhD is a degree that you get when you find something new about this world that further human knowledge, you know, what that means is a lot of degrees out there, like undergrad or master's degree, undergrad, um, in, in, in U S is typically four years. Um, in Indo is basically a satu, um, it's a degree that you, you pay and then you learn some things and then at the end you get your certificate, right? And it's similar for like S2 to master's, which is typically just one or two years and it's specialized like courses. But a PhD is uh, a totally different degree. In a sense, it's more like a training ground to be a scientist. That's what it is. And you don't pay, at least in the United States, you don't pay to be a PhD, but you get paid. Um, it's not, I mean, it's, it's a livable wage. It's not like a um, crazy amount of money, but still it's a training ground to be a scientist and you will get that degree if you find something new about the world, you know. And that is the goal of scientists in society, the people who are, um, who find new things. Like imagine the, the, like, you know, Newton 
right? Or, or um, like physicists, astronomers, Neil deGrasse Tyson, you know, these uh, Richard Feynman, um, people that figure out um, like the internet or, um, you know, astronauts, like NASA people. So these are, these are scientists, pe- people who are on the front line of science. Um, yeah, that's, that's what I would say about, about PhDs. Is there any specific thing you're curious about? Uh, I think there was one quote that, um, you mentioned when you were, uh, here, <laughs> um, when you yeah. were, uh, your, um, you mentioned that like the discoveries in um, the PhD program is like what's eventually like used in business that really resonated with me. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah, so it's it's interesting how it's interesting that you asked that because um, I've had I've had background in, in business by doing you know my own startup. Just a little uh, little quick thing for the audience out there. I went back to Indonesia. Uh, during like COVID times, 2020, to start like a fintech company, and also I've been dabbling in in uh, the startup community and start companies here in in Silicon Valley. Um, but also I've seen how things, how science progress by right? being in the PhD program and seeing like other scientists. Uh, there's like my senior, you know, and. It's it's interesting how um, how both of them are relate to each other. So science is well. I think in my case, it, by the way, my PhD is in computer science. So I just want to preface this that like there's a PhD in many other fields, right? There's physics PhD, there's math, but I, what I'm doing is computer science. Um, there's bio. And all that, and PhD is is you're doing science, which means you're figuring out something new about this world, something that uh, might not be might not know the answer to, you know, it's still unknown. And this is why a, a good test of uh, uh, a PhD is actually ha- have you find something new about this world. And it's actually not an easy answer. Like, if, if I ask you something, Gary, like, um, what is something that you can think about that is that is that no one else is know about this world you know it's it, it it sounds simple but a lot of time what you would come up with or what i would come up with you know it's probably already already talked about you know by other people because that's that's what humans do we learn from things and then oh maybe uh maybe that's true maybe that's how it is but like when you when you pick uh, a field and you spend like four or five six years sh- narrowing on one thing in my case it's computer science and within computer science there's an area called human computer interaction and then within that area there's a research about um augmented reality or the use cases of large language models so for people who don't know um, these buzzwords, augmented reality is the glasses where you wear and then you could see holograms, right? Um, it's not something that you see uh, in, in normal days. <laughs> but in research lab, they're exploring these new technologies. You know, you have these glasses. Hey, what happens if we send like a 3D message? How would people react to it? Uh, do they get scared? Is it actually more uh, um, personal than like other uh, medium like text or video, right? Um, that's actually the research I've done at uh, Snapchat. I used to work at Snapchat. 
before. And um, for example, another another research that I'm doing right now is uh, large language models. Uh, sounds a lot like magic, but it's really like the use case is like chat GPT, I think. So some people might heard of it. If you haven't, you know, check them out. It's pretty interesting. It's this um, AI that you could talk to. Um, so we're, again, this is like new technology, but the the research question that I, I'm trying to exp explore is, hey, can these AI models create beautiful websites just by you talking to them you know questions like this a lot of people might not care about it <laughs> but it's definitely new you know something that like we as a species we don't know yet the answer to this you know just imagine like like you know hundreds of years ago when newton first think about like hey why is <laughs> why is things falling down and no one knows the answer to it. That's kind of like the idea of like what 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 a PhD is. Um, you're figuring out something that's novel, which is in contrast to business, is a little bit different because in business, what you want to do is figure out what people want, <laughs> and it's not necessarily have to be novel. You know, if you have a similar product, but it's better in certain ways and serves certain market, you're building what people want. And by being rewarded, uh, with, uh, and if you give something what people want, you will be rewarded by society with money, right? Um, so it's interesting, like having done both of these, I see, yeah. Uh, research is about find something novel, uh, but not necessarily useful. <laughs> it has to be novel. But in business, it's like find something useful, find pe what people want. doesn't have to be necessarily novel. You could definitely steal ideas. Yeah. But the way they, at least in my field in computer science, the way it progresses is actually science usually start first in the beginning you know and 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 usually engineering goes on top of it and then business goes on top of it and by that i mean the internet right now we take it for granted right as an end user you pay the internet you know the isp or, or like you know in indonesia i don't know telkomsel or something um you you uh like carriers, right, to, to get access to the internet. Now it's already like a commodity. It's a business. Everyone can access the internet. But, you know, in in, in America, at least, in, in the early 90s, um, it was, well, let me, take, let me take it back even further. Like this technology in the 60s were explored as, uh, as science, you know, it, no one don't uh, no one has this idea of like um you know one day that you could just like pay a business and you get access to any other computers in the world you know back then in the 60s and the 50s researchers were exploring this hey how can we uh connect multiple computers that's far away in a network fashion such that if one that one can talk to another, but if one goes out, it doesn't kill the entire um, network. Right? If you really think about it, like it, it just starts from science, from like figuring out what's new, um, and then once it's once it's figured out, there's like prototypes by by scientists. Oh, you can use this protocol and all that. Um, you could do a lot of engineering, right? Like the ethernet cable, uh, was invented and then things get connected. And then at some point it becomes, uh, clear that a lot of people want their computers to get connected. And finally businesses take over and commercializes it. 
So I think that is the natural progression of how like science, the technology, again, this is specific to computers. I think um, there's different fields like, you know, PhD in psychology or PhDs in, uh, you know, or, um, or like bio uh, or healthcare and medicine. I think it, the, the steps could be different or the progression, but um, I think that's what I've seen so far. Yeah. Yeah. It's, that's um, super interesting, man. I think I could make a, yeah. a nice uh, Instagram reel out of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, um, I love, I love that yeah, part. <laughs> I, yeah. I like, I like, I like to babble a lot. I'm, you know, this is part of, <laughs> I think personality wise, uh, this is why I, <laughs> I became a PhD. Just, I just genuinely curious about ideas and like learn things. And then, you know, like to talk about it. Yeah. What were you like in uh high school? Ah, high school. That's, it's quite a long time ago. Um, those are those are interesting times. So, I actually grew up in I grew up in Indonesia. So, for everyone who uh, just to make it clear to everyone, grew up in Indonesia. Um, I went to high school in Indonesia. Actually, I went to high school to uh, SMA Lapan Jakarta in Bukit Duri. All right, shout out to the uh, SMA Lapan kids. Yeah, yeah. Shout out to <laughs> SMA Lapan kids. Um, <laughs> I I found that place very very interesting and challenging because I, I I don't know how it is now, but back then it was one of the toughest uh, high school to get into, the public the, the public one, um, and also my dad went there as well. Um, I think these days in Indonesia, you, you, um, do they, how does like high school um, admission works? Is it based on location these days? Uh, I think I just want to I've, double check. I've, I've read some news of it being like location based, like, yeah, like, like in here. Yeah. So, so I don't know, like it might've, it might've changed over time, but back in the day when I was, when I was, which is probably around the same time, right? It's like you and I, um, back then there's no restrictions on location. So I, I think we just try to go, uh, to high schools. And, um, I think I am blessed to, to be born in a, in a family that highly values education. And my dad always tried to challenge me to go to the best place or like hardest place to get into, which is also kind of like a psychology trick. I think my dad used against me because I'm a little bit rebellious and I, I don't like being challenged and losing to a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, yeah, I tried to get into like, um, hardest high school and it was uh i think the one the, the public one was um SMLA. but i think there's also many like good high schools in jakarta like i think the international ones was like gist or something yeah or like uh, the 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 um the private ones um yeah but that's that's the one that uh, that i got in and i was um there's a program in SMA Lapan called uh, Class Accelerasi. So it's like an acceler like an honor slash accelerated class, um, which they pick, I would say like the top 30 people out of, I think satu class itu like 300 people, um, 300-ish, 350 or something. And then they pick like, I'm sorry, it's not, it's not 30. Like the, they pick the top 20 to to get into that class and the thing is the funny thing is the way they picked it is they they have a lot of like like iq tests um 
kind of kind of like like SAT, but like more on like the the math and like IQ tests. And then, and then I remembered, I, I was like, ah, eh, f it, you know, like I'm I'm just gonna try it out. And then, and then um, I do it. Apparently, I, I got in, but I was like the the bottom. <laughs> like five of that class. So I, I thought it, it was funny because looking back, I was, I mean, I, I guess, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm lucky to, to get into the cutoff of the IQ test. But at the same time, looking back, I was a very lazy, like high schooler. <laughs> <laughs> no way. <laughs> no, I'm actually super lazy. Uh, cause, cause I feel like so far, um, like, I don't know, schoolwork was, was kind of like a breeze to me, like middle school and like elementary school, but I was also a troublemaker to, to, so for anyone that knows me, I think they know I'm, 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 I'm a troublemaker, maker in school because, um, I, I just make fun of like teachers and like start like school riots or like heckles and all that kind of stuff so i was i was uh, yeah i was a troublemaker in class but um but the funny thing is like my, my grades was like it was it was pretty good so um there were times where i get i get called a lot um they can't really kick me out but um but at the same time, like, yeah, I was making trouble, and then um, I would remember, I would, I would, I would remember how, um, how um, uh, my dad would show up in front of the the teachers or the principals, and they were saying that, like, yeah, your your son is, makes trouble, <laughs> and then. Um, uh, uh, the interesting thing is he would always uh, defend me saying that like, yeah, I know like this kid's or like, it, this kid is, is not cow, but like, he's smart. Like you just need to like teach them, teach him the right way. And um, I was like, okay, yeah, nice. But then when we left school, he would like smack me, <laughs> like, <laughs> like give me the beating, like why are you having so much trouble? <laughs> So I was like, oh no! Uh, I was like, dang it! Um, so I try, I try to, uh, yeah, not to make too much trouble. But I was, I was a troublemaker. But um, I, I remember I, actually, there's a lot of, well, no, there's a couple teachers who who noticed that, like, um, like though I am um like a troublemaker, like I'm genuinely curious, and if 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 um. I remember there's like a like a math teacher and physics teacher and like like uh like computer teacher who would who would show me like hey you know like just lightly challenge me like um I think you could do this like uh build build like a like a you know uh like a calculator in like Visual Basic or something uh you can do that and it's like. And surprisingly, I was I was like middle school. I think I was I was so into that, and I and I really appreciate those kind of teachers, you know, who are who are um you know always try to see um the good and the and the talent of the kids, which now being in academia, like doing PhD, I try I try to do the same. Um, but anyway, like yeah, I was a troublemaker in high school, um, got into the accelerated class, but I quickly realized, oh man, like everyone else is smart and also way smarter than me. So I got into the top class, which is only 20 people, but I'm the bottom three. (laughs) (laughs) So I think that was the first time in my life I felt like the underdog. Um... I felt like I felt like an idiot, honestly. And to 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 give to give a quick idea, like how how hard it is. It, it's um so they have like 
you know, in, in, in school, it's, um, it's three years, right, in Indonesia. By the way, um, I just want to say something about to all Indonesian kids out there, like, our school is actually pretty hard compared to, <laughs> I feel like, a lot of, like, other Western standards. Because I remembered by the end of, like, high school, we learned, like, uh, calculus. Um, did, you, did you do that, like, Gary, in yeah, yeah. high school? Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. And, and and I and I went to college here, and and there's people who just started calculus in college, you know, and um and I was like, what? Like this is we we've done like a lot of these already in high school. But anyway, talking about like I th- I think one of the benefit of going to high school in Indonesia is actually the material is actually pretty hard. So if you're good at it. <laughs> Chances are you're pretty good compared to like global, you know, students, uh, high school students. Um, but like normal high school is three years, like this accelerated, accelerated class is two years. So they really cram the, the semester. It's like, I remember you learn about new chapter in school. You know, like for example, um, yeah, uh, for example, like math. This it's been a while, but like uh, differential equation or something. You just learn it for a week, and then the next week it's gonna be like practice. You know, and then the, the next week after that, an exam. Yeah, you know, that's how. Yeah, that's how fast the pace is, and and this is not just like one. Um, class obviously you know it's like high school so you're running like what seven class and then the pace is like that like one two three exam one two three exam one two three exam so it's 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 very it's very fast um and and it's pretty common to fail an exam they call it uh remed, remedial they call it remed, remed. Um, the thing is like it's okay if you fail um if you get remed uh, and then you retake the exam, but you have to be, you have to pass. Uh, passing score is 75. So you have to pass um, that. But I think you get cap. Like if you, if you, if you, if you done the second time way better, um, you got full score, you got cap at, at like 90% or 80% or something. But the point is like um, failing is not, bad but the problem is if you keep failing too often and and those those exa- those re- remit uh stacks up because like if you remit you, you kind of like slow down your own pace right the class still goes but you still need to retake the exam um if you if you done that like three times in a row you're most likely going to get kicked out of that class yeah, you're gonna go back to the regular class, which feels like a big shame back then. <laughs> back, back, back of the normies, <laughs> right? Yeah, which is which is look now, which is now like looking back, it was like, dude, like it's nothing at all. It's like totally fine. Like you get kicked out, you go back to the normal, you know, normal class. But looking back, back there, uh, back then, it was such like a big pride thing for these kids. Because they know that like you, you're not smart enough for this class, and you gotta go back. Um, but you know, it doesn't really matter now, not really. But um, that kind of envi- environment really taught me about, you know, about survival. You know, about like competition. Um, I can't be lazy anymore, and that was the point. I start to like, like start building habits um learning habits um uh, learning with from multiple people and um till now i'm i'm very close with like a lot of my high school friends from from that class you know they're i would say they're like one of the a few of the smartest people i know and and um they all go to many places one of them is in japan one of them in is germany uh a couple of them went to like UK, um, 
one started a company yeah these are like very you know really good friends and they're smart and hardworking really like to keep in touch with them and yeah i think the hardest points and hardest environments in life actually taught me the most on you know on on survival on competition which is by the way very very uh useful as you get older especially if you go to a competitive nation like united states <laughs> <laughs> interesting yeah but also like a little quick little quick thing um like i was still again d- during my high school days i was still also like hang like hang out um you know like ada namanya um anak nongkrong in sma 8 <laughs> the, the 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 nongkrong spot is called uh, kermes um i was i was like one of the few you know few kids in in that honor class to actually hang out <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of funny i'm like the dumbest kid in the honor class but um, um you know but also hang out with like the, the 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 cool kids but but over there i'm like so i'm like the thuggest kid you know the dumbest of the axel class but also like the smartest of the anak nongkrong <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting uh, dichotomy. Yeah, yeah, but that, that, that's the, that's the funny thing about me. Like I, I think personality wise, I'm 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 just like rebellious and 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 also like don't like to follow rules and follow the normal paths, um, which is interestingly like a lot of these anak nongkrong end up becoming like good business people <laughs> because what they do is actually like you know build up connections and like try to find values and try to connect the dots um yeah they're they tend to be entrepreneurial but whereas like the axel kids tend to be um you know like I- intelligent but tend to like follow the rules and all that so i'm kind of like the always spin the 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 gray duckling <laughs> in both sides um i used to feel weird about it but i think as i get older i realize hey this is just you know it's 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 who i am you know i'm i'm that i'm that phd kid who who likes business <laughs> and party <laughs> nice <laughs> so yeah all right um so tell me how you got interested in like computer science and then eventually touch on like what got you interested in like doing a phd like yeah that's a really good question um yeah so i'm curious do you do you grew up play play any games got it Oh yeah, I played a ton of games. I'm I'm a low key gamer. <laughs> what kind of what kind of game did you pick? Did you play? Uh, Battlefield Two, Get on Path, Left for Dead. Okay, okay. Do you play any like uh, MMORPG games? Oh, unfortunately, no. <laughs> Not really. Okay. Not really. So so I'm like I grew up playing a lot of okay a little little backstory um. My dad is like a very strict guy. Um, he's he's the one who drive a lot of you know like education career in in my family. Um, he um, he was very forward about like technology adoption. So we we were kind of like. I remember, he brought like a he bought like a computer, um, in the maybe like mid 2000s i i think like there is a time in in asia where like we know computers exist but it's still like rather exp- expensive that's why we have like the warnet right yeah, if you, yeah like it's interesting that we when i when i step back and then i talk to a lot of my like american friends um they don't have a phenomenon like like warnet like internet cafes is not a thing because 
uh, when the when when the when the computers came out, um, and then it gets cheaper and cheaper, like it just get adopted by the families, which is like a couple thousand dollars. But like in Indonesia, or a couple thousand or a couple hundred dollars. But in Indonesia, that's quite a lot, right? Like I think, I think growing up in Indonesia, like dua juta itu, like it sounds like a lot of money, you know. <laughs> And and like computers is pretty, pretty expensive. So I think, um, like um, like having access to computers is 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 um a totally was a total blessing. Um, so my dad had like an old computer that that he bought um to do um like work, and and I would use it. But he's so against like games, like believe it or not, I never had a con- console in my life. I never had PS satu, PS dua, up until PS PS five. Like I never had those. <laughs> I never played. Yeah, I never played any console like Xbox. That's why, like, it's funny. Like I saw a lot of friends playing like FIFA in Indo. Right, FIFA is like famous. Like when my friends were like. Hey, Risky. Hey, Willy. You wanna uh, play FIFA? And I'm like, sure, but I I don't know how to play it. <laughs> I don't know. I never had a console. Um, I think the only the only time I ever had a game console was a Game Boy Advance. My mom snuck it. She bought it um, outside of Indonesia, um, in Singapore or something. She bought it for me as a gift. It's a birthday gift or something, and I, I love it so much. I played that like Pokemon Emerald. Um, but my my dad soon realized, and it's like this kid keeps playing games, so <laughs> <laughs> he he hid my Game Boy, um, so I couldn't play that much. But because of that, I was I was like, okay, we have this computer, and I want to play games. So I was so I was exposed to like computer games. Back then, and I, and I learned how to like hide it, like you know, alt tabbing and like hiding <laughs> things, hiding um, folders, <laughs> right, hidden folders and all that. So like that constraint <laughs> actually pushed me to explore computers and and the games and um, and learn tricks to you know to to use computers and um. One of the games that really hooked me was uh, Black Metal Online. I don't know if you've heard of it. Yeah, it's yeah, a I've very, it. it's a very famous game. We um in middle school, I would play it with a lot of my friends, which is still like one of one of like still still few of my good friends till now. I remember because I remember going to school is less about like learning back then in middle school. Um, I would play games at night, you know, play Ragnarok online at night, and then the next day we I meet friends to 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 catch up about like, hey, what are we gonna do tonight <laughs> in our <laughs> Ragnarok <laughs> online game? So I really think that was an amazing phenomenon, you know. Yeah, uh, for um, our uh, like audiences online. who aren't Indonesian, Ragnarok online is like World of Warcraft. <laughs> yes, it's really like World of Warcraft, but I think. I think visual wise, it's more like RuneScape. I think it's it's like two D. RuneScape is two D, right? Is it two D? Uh, oh, not so, really. Yeah. 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 So it's more like two D, but like MMORPG. Um, this really is like the olden days of like social media. You know, you go there to meet to meet friends. This is like internet messenger <laughs> era. Um. But yeah, and then but as I get, as I move from like um, later years in high school, I'm sorry, later years in middle school, I I start to realize, oh no, I I I start to not have much time, you know, and I'm kind of like, okay, so I want to get, I want to be great at this game, but I don't have much time. How can I solve this? I wish. There's a way for my characters to be playing while I'm sleeping. 
you know. And that was the time I was I was like around 12, 13 at this point, you know, uh, middle school days. And uh, I realized, hey, maybe, um, maybe there there's an answer out there in the Internet. This is early days in the Internet, you know. So um, Google still have like, you know, uh, that <laughs> old interface and then like websites still have like banner ads, you know. Um, so I look into it and then I stumbled into like bot programs, like Ragnarok Online bot programs. So apparently if you run this software in your computer, you can tell the Ragnarok Online server that it seems like you are playing the game but actually it's a program that runs your character excuse me so i realized oh wow like if i have this file and i can set up this configuration you know change like my character name i put my like username password um you know i set a uh, uh, an instruction for my character to go to this field in the game and attack this monster. And then when, when it's full of items, you go back and you, you know, you store the items and blah, blah, blah. Like I could run a character autonomously and I could just go to bed <laughs> and the program runs itself. Looking back, like the, the whole thing was, really a precursor of programming you know a programming but i don't know this is called programming i just know that like oh, my character is gonna get stronger tomorrow you know i'm gonna get money so so from then i started like every every night instead of me playing games it's about exploring the the pro the bot program to how my character plays the game so uh, <laughs> instead of playing the game i create you know i focus on the program that plays the game <laughs> so one step higher yeah so i i remember those those uh those programs is still on bait on like i think it's a Perl programming language i don't even know how to code in Perl even until now but still like i know how to like set up like the scripts and all that so that was like very, 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 very interesting. And um, yeah. And then I loved it so much because to me, it's like tinkering. Um, it reminds me when I was younger, I, I, I like to play a lot with like Lego, you know. Um, my dad bought me a lot of like Legos and Bionicles and all that kind of stuff. Like I, I love tinkering so much. Uh, I I remember even in like elementary school, I would buy like like cables and and like batteries, and I would like link them together to a lamp, like make a makeshift, uh, you know, uh, flashlight and all that kind of stuff. And that reminds me of that. Like, oh wow, this this is this is so fun. This is like tinkering for me, um, but ex ex except physical things it's more like uh software uh, well i don't know it's software but like it's a, it's a virtual game right i get to the point where like i make one character do very very well on like leveling up and like going to somewhere gathering items and go back and i realize hey hold on a second like this works with one if this works with one character what if i create 10 characters so i just spin up 10 of them and they all gather the same go go out gather the same thing go back and i realize wow you know like if i can 10 p 10 characters doing really well gathering things what kind of characters what 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 kind of uh characters i could create that do something with the with the items that's gathered you know so i i build another like 10 characters that take all that resources make it to like better items 
And at some point, like, okay, I have a lot of good items. What do I do with it? Maybe I could sell it to other people. <laughs> so I end up building like an enterprise of bots. And I was like, thir- like 13, 14, you know? I was like, I think in total, okay, maybe in total, it's not like 30. I think in total, it's more like in the teens. But imagine like five characters are hunting and gathering uh, items. Another two is like refining things. And then another five, you know, it's like selling the things. So if you really think about it, like that, that was also like the precursor of me like doing business. You know, I I start to realize I'm like, oh, like I like this, and quickly I start to make money in the game, and then I start to buy and sell things um, with real money because some people want to buy my item, but also sometimes I realize, hey, I got money. I have like I remember it, like I have seratus ribu, dua ribu, which which is feels like a lot of money when you're like thirteen in 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 the two thousands, right? And um. I start buying like rare items and then reselling it. And then uh, my bots makes money and I sell the mon- the virtual money for real money. Um, which is funny because back in the day, there's only like cascos. There's no way to like, <laughs> like verify payments, you know. And the only way to do things is to, to just like through reputation on cascos and like, Man, I think I I really think the Cascos founder really blew it up, man. Like, they could have been like Tokopedia, you know what I mean? Like looking back, but anyway, and you need to like transfer things with BCA, like the the bank, the BCA bank with like ATM transfer. I was like, oh my god, it's such a the day. But I don't have an ATM. I was thirteen, right? <laughs> so I gotta use my mom's. <laughs> <laughs> My my mom's bank account. I'm like, mom, can I borrow your bitch bank account? I was like, oh, oh like, what do you want to do? I was like, I just send friends money, and get money. <laughs> like they they owe me something. But at some point, like, I make like, like something like stupid good money. Like, like one time, I think I got transferred like three million rupiah. Damn. And I, yeah, and this is like like again, three million is quite a lot. When you're when I was like thirteen, you know, fourteen ish, you know, in Indonesia, you know, that that was um, like three hundred dollars. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in, like three hundred dollars. Like ex- yeah. exchange rates from those days. <laughs> yeah, with exchange rate from those days, like three hundred dollars. That that seems like a lot of money. And my mom was like, "What are you doing? How did how did you get this money?" And I'm like, and, and she. I was like, it's it's don't worry about it, mom. And she was like, Are you are you selling drugs, Rizky? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I don't what, what is drugs? I don't know even I, I don't know drugs. I was thirteen. And she's the one who, who and, I, and then I had to explain it to her, like, I'm selling this thing, it's a virtual item. So yeah, so I think I think looking back, that that really drove me to like virtual things, games. Um and I remembered I played a lot of Dota. I played a lot of like these, these bots. And towards the end of high school, again, I, I'm at, like I get exposed early and I get curious early. But at the same time, I haven't started coding back then. I only started coding when I'm like seventeen. Um. I, I guess that's it could be pretty early to to like Indonesian standard, but I think I think compared compared to like a lot of my friends who are like in Silicon Valley, <laughs> some of them like started coding when they're like twelve, you know. So that's, <laughs> that's crazy. But I started coding when I was like yeah sixteen seventeen um, when I was about to finish high school, because because again like my high school is like I went to the accelerated class, um, two years just fly by quick and I didn't really plan where to go a lot of people the default thing to go to is like UI and ITB right in Indonesia like for um I guess for global audience uh, UI and ITB it's kind of like the, the Ivy League I guess <laughs> of like Indonesia every 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 kids try to go there 
but I just feel like, oh man, this is so, so tracked, so boring, so, so predictable. I don't want to, I don't want to follow the status quo, you know? And, and, and I told my dad, it's like, I'm very like, I, I don't know what I want to do in life, but what I know, what I know is like, I like this computer thing, you know? I like this computer thing and I want to be good at it. And then he also like, yeah, I think you're you're pretty pretty good at it. Um I think that the the amazing thing about uh, my dad is just he when it comes to like career and like education, he he's he's very supportive on things. He's very against game and like and like partying, but <laughs> but when it comes to like uh academic stuff, like he's very supportive and he just like, "Hey, if you if you were like and and supportive as in like he he would go the extra mile you know like my mom is basically like the source of love you know she's the one that like whatever you do you know you know as long as you're uh, don't do crime you know <laughs> I, I will always love you you know so so my, my mom is just the the bedrock for emotional and mental health but my dad is the one who, who usually like push it you know he he would go like I mean, if you want to be, if you really like computers, like you have to go to the best place in the world. You know, it's not just like the best place in, in Indonesia or not in Jakarta. No, you have to be to go to the best place in the world. And where is that? You know, and that is in Silicon Valley. You know, it, it's in America. And at that time, it just felt so, so far. It felt so expensive. I barely speak English. <laughs> my dad, my dad put me in like, um, my dad put me in like courses, like English English courses, uh, since I was like ten, or maybe even younger, like six. Um, it's I think it's called uh, ILP or EF, you know, one of those things. But like I was, I was barely like I I know in theory how to how to speak English, but like like it's different when you like read things versus like you speak it daily, right? Um, which is interesting because looking back, like I don't, yeah, I barely speak English, but now it's almost like like sometimes I I'm more kabata bata speak Indonesian. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, same like here. Crazy how, <laughs> yeah, right. Um, and then, and that and that, that's the thing about language, right? You you felt it too. Like the more you speak it, the more like there there is a time where your mind speaks in one language, and then you need to translate it in real time to speak it in English, you know. But the more you talk, the more you speak one language. At some point, you're gonna start. St- thinking in that language and that's the point where like you get like pretty fluent you know um yeah anyway okay like uh after high school my my dad was like yeah we gotta go um uh we gotta go we're gonna figure out a way to send you to america to the united states we don't have money for for college (laughs) Like in, in enough money for like an Indonesian college, but definitely not like US. Um, like just to give an idea, right? Like how much how much is colleges in in Indonesia again? Like I forgot, it's in like tens of millions, right? Rupiah, which is like a couple thousand dollars. Yeah, uh, I think sounds about right. Yeah. I think it just just to give an idea to like the global audience, like it, Indonesian um, high school is about like a couple thousand dollars, you know, compared to to like a college here in US, which is like what sixty thousand uh, a year. And, and that sounds about right, right? Got I guess there's like pl- yeah, yeah, sounds about right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, th- yeah, that's the thing. Like it's a uh, pretty high like um i think it ranges but it's in the tens of thousands per year you know so that's the scale yeah 
we were like, uh, we have no money, but like, fuck it, like, let's figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but then we realize um, there's this thing called a community college. And, and uh, fun, fun fact, this is how like, uh, I met Gabe too. Like G- Gabe is a mutual friend of Gadi and I. Um, and it's also like a friend of mine. His name is Fron. Um, he's he's a cool Indonesian guy too. Like um, maybe uh, if you if you want to chat with him, like I could intro you guys. He's a he's currently a, an engineer at Google in New York, but he he went to the same high school with me, Indo guy. Um, been in the U.S. for like yeah, been been in the U.S. for about like what nine ten years now. Um. Yeah, he 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 went to a community college in Texas, and he told me like, "Hey, there's this thing like, you know, like you could go to a cheaper, like smaller college, um, but it's much more like, um, you know, like international student friendly, right? So I think it's a good like." uh ground for us to 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 learn about like the culture and to adapt and then after like one or two years you could transfer to like a a normal college yeah so that's what i did i went to a community college in california uh, in in north in in silicon valley actually like that's the best place to go (laughs) looking back that's like wow that's like really spot on going to Community college saves a lot of money. Um, again, because that that's the only that's as as much money as we as we can have on for like one year. The rest we have to like figure it out. Um, and yeah, my I, I remember my parents have to sell like assets to you know like my dad was happened to to buy a land like long time ago, but he had to sell a lot of them. Um, to, to fund my school. Um, so at the same time, you know, like I, I don't mess around too, you know, like when, when we're like betting the house, <laughs> you don't mess around in school. It's uh, cause I know how much, how much it costs, how much painful it is to, to send me here. And, um, yeah, really just like raise up the stakes and, um, I um I went to yeah community college in Silicon Valley and get exposed to a lot of the you know the tech industry and and the people and the culture a lot of made a lot of friends and and I spent about like one and a half years there um. First time I got here, I was barely speaking English. I couldn't finish like a whole sentence, but towards the end, I could I could speak a whole sentence. So that that was an improvement. And um, I transferred to University of Illinois. Um, I applied to a couple schools in California, but um, I got into a couple UC. I think UC San Diego, but. Um, I was just so curious about the rest of the the country. You know, I I figured I would probably never had a chance to explore the Midwest. Um, but I heard U of I has like really good computer science school, but also really good like social scene, which really fits me. <laughs> so I uh, yeah, I picked there, um, studied computer science, and it's just an amazing. Uh, time there like I I think I grew as a person a lot during this period like mentally socially um, you know financially um, was the whole undergrad I was able to you know I was lucky to work at you know big tech companies like Yahoo PayPal you know and I got into like the one year master program and and I learned that like if you if you TA you could actually get tuition waiver, which means I don't pay for school. Um 
yeah so i got my masters for free um yeah i i end up spending like like three years in in university of illinois you know getting my bachelor's and my master's and yeah during that time i was ex i was trying out research i tried startups and uh, the professor that's my advisor right now um i did research at her lab and i thought oh wow this is so cool and she also like very entrepreneurial so that really i really vibe with her and um and she's been like a mentor to me up until now both in in um in research and also in startups like when i started a fintech company in indo like you know they actually my uh, my advisor actually put money as an investor you know so so yeah it's it's um yeah i look back i saw her as like okay you know she she's like a really good mentor i should follow so yeah i learned from her um yeah i, I don't know it sounds like a very long-winded thing but <laughs> i hope that answers the question so that's what made you decide to do a pursue a phd yeah so um towards the end towards the end of the uh, of my masters um i know at some point like okay uh, i've tried working at a company um it's it's totally fine actually it makes good money like being a software engineer um i like engineering um but at some point uh i just i just get easily bored <laughs> that's my problem <laughs> and at some point i i just don't feel like like intellectually challenged startups on the other hand by the way like in college i started this virtual reality tour startup called vertition with uh, a bunch of classmates we build like vr tour platforms using headsets um, our clients are for real estate management firms so it allows them to have imagine a youtube screen in a listing page but instead of like a video it's actually a 3d scene where you can walk around um, like a 3d game but if you have like a headset as well um, you could explore it as if you're there so our so the insight back then was like hey when i moved from california to illinois i did i couldn't check my apartment unless i flew in there so what if there's like what if this new technology this is around 2016 you know what if this vr technology being uh massly uh, you know adopted by mass um this could be revolutionary um well now we know they <laughs> vr only stuck in the gaming niche it didn't go uh mass market um and also we learned that like on that first startup um uh Building cool things is one thing, but selling is another. And I really learned how to sell back then because I have, I have to, you know, imagine I was, I was like around, how old was I? Like twenty sixteen, it's like seven years ago, right? As I was 2016, 2017, I was like twenty one, twenty two. You know, I have to like look somewhat professional. You know, with with a blazer, which which sticks with me. I like blazers now. Uh, um, go to like this real estate firms and try to sell like, hey, what well, we built this technology from research and it could help you, you know, engage your customer and blah blah blah. Um, so we actually made like the like the the project itself actually uh, makes money, um, like. A, you know in in the range of like a couple thousand dollar but it's not growing that fast you know it's not like startup level money that you could raise venture capital on 
So we're kind of like, okay, that was like a good learning point. But after like a year and a half, we we closed that down. Like, um, um, yeah, we no longer learn uh, work on that, but we learn a lot. And uh, and I think at that point, like my advisor looked at me and like, okay, you you're definitely talented. You're definitely smart, ambitious, and and entrepreneurial. Um, why don't you be my PhD student? And I'm like, but I don't want to be a professor. <laughs> And she was like, well, you know, PhD is kind of like a degree where you could explore so many things, you know, uh, you could explore in cutting edge of technology, you know, you could have extra time to figure out startups too, if you want, you know, like high tech, like deep tech startup. It's like, mm, actually, okay. Um, so at that point, my option was three, one, be a software engineer which is, uh, I, I got bored easily so, uh, after like the third month because I, I interned a lot, so I know how the progression is like. Um, but also in America, there's the there's the visa of like H1, H1B visa and it's it's like a lottery. And I don't know, I kind of I kinda don't like my future being relied on relied on like a lottery you know i don't like if there is a choice with like the the outcome i mean i know luck involves um luck is involved in a lot of our lives but i tr i like to put effort into things you know i like to make my own luck which is kind of funny because risky my name means luck well <laughs> um but I, I I like to make my own luck instead of like relying it fully on 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 like some lottery. Um, the other choice was um, start another startup, but like startups is also very like high risk, um, very high risk. Um, uh, if you hit it, you you could you could win a lot, and it's very challenging, and I like that challenge. Um, but also I was I was burnt out at that point after that first company, you know, first first startup that I built. And the third one was like, hey, try, you know, do the PhD. I've done research before, you know. So I was like, okay, most people go to the engineering job. <laughs> um, and I know at some point I'm, I'm, I'm going to figure out like startups over time too. So be, me being another, you know, rebel, rebellious kid who doesn't like to follow everyone else. I just like, you know what, screw it. I'll do, I'll do the PhD. I'll do the, I'll do the hard, weird, challenging ones. And um, yeah, so that was, that, honestly, that was, that was the story. And then, um, yeah, learned a lot. Um, learn uh, as most, almost any any aspect of computer science at this point. Like I I know generally where things are. I know. Um, yeah. Yeah, I hope I hope that answers the question. Yeah, that that was an amazing answer, um, as always. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, a PhD. Um, yeah. Who is it for and who is it not for? If let's say you're in university, you just graduate. Yeah. I think P the PhD is a, definitely an interesting career path. Um, I don't think it's for everyone because it's actually very hard and it's very challenging. Um, I used to joke, I always joke around like uh, people who are in the PhD program. Uh, are they smart? Maybe. Are they crazy? Definitely. <laughs> 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 because, uh, because I think if you want money, I think there are much better ways to make money than be, than doing a PhD. You know, just work at like an engineering job that that is in high demand. You know, so that's one. 
Um, but I think who is a PhD for? I think one, if you are very curious about certain field and you want to be the best or the most knowledgeable at one narrow field, I think the PhD program is is really good. Um path to take if you want to do a research job later on which means a job that lets you explore new things you know um, definitely the PhD is a way to go to and if you're easily bored at a normal job again the PhD is too but again the PhD is not um, It, I think it's interesting in Indonesia, the prog the way they call PhD is like S D G, you know, which seems like it gives an impression that's like, it's a stage of like S1, S2, S3, you know, like S3 is better than S2 because S3 is higher than two. <laughs> but, but, I, but it's different here because like the PhD is more like a research uh, training you know in fact the first two years of a phd is actually like a master like an s2 you know um i think for practical reasons if you just want to make more money s2 is probably the best bang for the buck you know the the best um investment but s is um you're curious about something you want to be the best at something and then And then it's a degree that you you don't pay for. It's the degree that you earn. So this is why um, it's a very painful four, five, six, seven years. But you will know a lot of people that have done PhD, they're like tough, smart, <laughs> ambitious people, you know, like, like Huberman. You know, PhD. Lex Friedman, PhD. Elon was a PhD student before he dropped out. <laughs> so, you, you know, it's just, you know, these are these are hard people, like hardcore, smart, uh, ambitious people. Um, you know, Larry Page, Sergey Brin. Um, so you don't you don't question their their intelligence and talent. Um, you just know they're they're filtered to get that far and um yeah what do you like most about it though i think the yeah again the one that i like the most is um like the freedom to explore and learn about cutting edge technology in computer science and get paid for it so it's a good deal <laughs> it is yeah but again, it's not easy. Um, a lot of people want to be in this spot too, so it's competitive. Um, and also, like, um, I think in computer science, you could get paid pretty well just being an engineer. You know, I think these days, like the starting engineering salary in Silicon Valley, computer science is like, like six figure, like low six figure. Um, if you are like a PhD, you spend like four, five, six years. Maybe you you're getting in as like a senior engineer if you want to be an engineer, or you could be a scientist or like a research engineer, um, which is also six figure, but it's just like a little bump. So if you just want money, um, it might not actually the best uh, financial decision. But chances are, if you're in research. And you like, um, like, let's say my case, I like AI and augmented reality research. I, I think primarily right now, I'm just doing AI. Um, the kind of jobs that is accessible for an AI PhD is just mind-blowingly awesome. <laughs> you know, like imagine like going to like uh, a self-driving team in Tesla. You know, the one that's designing that. Everyone wants to go there. So by having a PhD and having publications, 
and showing that like, hey, I'm I'm really good at this, you know. You have a much higher chance of joining that team, you know. Um yeah, it's it's painful, but you get to get the cool jobs and you surround yourself with other other, you know, hardcore, smart, ambitious people. Yeah. All right, just a final few questions. Um, who is someone that uh, inspires you? Someone that inspires me. Okay, so I think. Um, can I have like can I can I have like three three people? Sure, sure. Uh, you can have three. It also it doesn't <laughs> have to be like the person in general. Maybe you can be inspired by their family life or just their business life. Alone, right. So. Yeah, I, I, I really think there there is like three um like models that are that I really respect. Um one is there's this guy called Naval Ravikant. And um I think Naval is one of the philosopher king in Silicon Valley. Um, he's an angel investor and also a founder back in the day, but he would always say, he would always um, like find knowledge and, and, and package it in such a good way. He's almost like a prophet to me. <laughs> a lot of the things he say is amazing. You should, you should yeah, I, I think for anyone who's listening, check out Naval Ravikant. Um Another one is James Dyson, and I'm always amazed with inventors since I was young. And I, and I think I remembered, like when I was a kid, like my teachers or my dad would ask me, or my, you know, you know, when, when you were a kid, like adults always come to you and be like, "Hey, what do you want to do when you go when you grow up?" You know, what what was your answer? Got got to... <laughs> I wanted to be some kind of athlete because. I watched the really? Captain Subasa and stuff like that. I wasn't good at all, though. But like, <laughs> this, this looks cool. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's awesome. It's awesome. Yeah, yeah. So uh, when I get asked that question, I, I have two answers. First, I told them I want to be a comedian. <laughs> <laughs> what? Because I just like, um, you know, making people happy, and I think. Making people happy just by the power of your words is just awesome. Like I like comedian. This is why I get into trouble a lot. I was the class, <laughs> class clown in in in, in school. Um, but then, more seriously, I would say an inventor. You know, I I want to create things that are helpful create new things that is helpful to other people. That's why a lot of my idols have been like, you know, the, the books I've read a lot is about like biographies of like inventors, um, you know, like Benjamin Franklin or, or like other founders. Like I, I probably read so many founder books, like from, from the Cook brothers, from like Disney, Sony, Steve Jobs. I, I've I've read all their biographies. Um, Akio Morita of Sony. Um, yeah, but I think one that stood out was James Dyson. Yeah. Elon Musk has a good biography too. Um, Jeff Bezos. Uh, but James Dyson. Oh, Phil Knight has a good autobiography as well, The Shoe Dog, which is uh, the story of Nike. Um, but I think the one that really stood, stout, stood out for me was uh, James Dyson, um, the founder of Dyson. Um, because that guy, unlike Mark Zuckerberg, um, you know, the story of Mark Zuckerberg, right? Like young, tried something, it blew up, become a billionaire by like, young very young like under 30 under 30 but the story of james dyson is the total opposite he's just like working at an agency save money um have a crazy idea like have a crazy idea of like 
of like a vacuum cleaner. Something that is so boring. So no one think about it. And he just thinks like the vacuum cleaner sucks and no one re- reinvented that, you know. He spent like he was 40 with two like a couple kids in a in a house in a mortgage. And he quit his job. He was practically unemployed for years. And he was tinkering the first Dyson vacuum cleaner. Like vacu- vacuum that doesn't use vacuum bags, you know. And he went through like, I don't, I don't know the numbers, but, but it was along like 4,000 prototypes or something. And he was taking loans from the bank with, with the with the house as the collateral <laughs> <laughs> years after years he was experimenting and and everyone thought he was crazy up until he finally figured out how to create a vacuum cleaner without bags and it's just way way better than the competitors so now if you take a look at james dyson that guy is a billionaire who still owns 100 percent of that company <laughs> It's crazy because he didn't raise money. Yeah, that's just amazing. So then he's the second person. The third person would be my grandpa, my own grandpa from my mother's side. He was um. He was a merchant from Sumatra. He was a. Uh, he grew up so poor that one of his brother died out of poverty. Like. It was they couldn't eat. Like her, her, his his brother passed away, and then we, uh, and and then he he ran away from home, and Marantau, uh, to Jakarta, and he started selling water bottles, um, cigarette packs, um, and just buying and selling and just grinding it up from the streets you know he like 30 40 years later he 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 got a couple stores you know in 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 Tanabang <laughs> <laughs> in a really good place in Jakarta and and he he raised really good family big house and all that and like and he was really the idol of like like the entrepreneur you know I think my dad. I mean, I mean, I respect my dad too. Um, I think my dad gave me the 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 intellectual baseline and the discipline. Um, but my grandpa, from my mother's side, um, he's the one that that's like more like very entrepreneurial and like survive and grow business. Um, and yeah, I think. I think um, without without him pulling himself and his family out of poverty, well, my dad too. My dad grew up very poor, and both of and and the way he, the way my grandpa get out of poverty, uh, poverty was uh, business, you know, by being a merchant. And my dad, the way he go out of poverty was um, schooling. I think back in the day, he was one of the few people. Who got a scholarship in in like uh, Stan Sekolah Tinggi Akuntansi Negara, to be, you know, and then um, do really well in accounting, and then do finance in in like uh, in a big like family like Bakri like Bakri Group, I think, you know, um, and then he did MBA, which is pretty rare, I think, in the I think it was in, in the 80s you know to do like an MBA um, so he he pulled himself out of poverty through education my my grandpa out of like business so I think yeah so have, having these role models like my grandpa and my dad um, really I think really shaped me and um, it kind of make me like I look at them and I'm like okay I can't lose to them you know I gotta be better <laughs> <laughs> Hey, you know that's kind of like my personality too i don't i don't like losing i you know i i want to be better than anyone yeah and um yeah that's uh 
Yeah, I think Naval, James Dyson, my grandpa, Bizarre, the idols. All right, uh, one last question is... Let's go. Okay, uh, what advice do you have for um, high school students or college students? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of advice. Oh man, if I if I could have an advice, like I would I would make a book out of it. Actually, I am I am I am gonna make a book. Um, I like reading and writing, and I think and I think um, I grew up reading a lot of like fiction. Um, but as I get older, I I read a lot of. Um, like self-help and like nonfiction books. And I do think reading is one of the best habit you, you could do when you're young. Um, so I think one of the important things when you're young, especially when you're a high school and college students is actually watch your habit, you know, build good habits and, and kick out the bad ones. Um, and I'm not perfect. I used to like growing up in Indonesia. I used to smoke cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> That's like the socially acceptable thing to <laughs> when you're nongkrong, right? Like kopi, kopi and rokok, which is like the staples. But like, but smoking was so bad. It's very addicting, and and over the long term, like it's just gonna ruin your health. You know. So I quit. I quit cold turkey. I. Um, I'm like tobacco free for like what seven years now. Um, not going back. Um, which is interestingly, it taught me a lot about like habits and addiction. But again, going back to the question, like when you're young, watch your habits, delete the bad ones. Bad ones is like, um, like eating bad food, you know, surrounding yourself with lazy uh, people, you know um being being lazy you know um uh, smoking cigarettes drinking alcohol you know like a little bit of these is okay but like if it becomes a habit and you keep doing it you keep doing a lot of these you know like drugs you know try to reduce that you know don't uh, don't make it a habit and you install good ones you know i like to think of myself as as a system as 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 a creature of habit you know the good ones is like reading you know consume content that's that is good um i mean i like tiktok but i limit like how my how much tiktok i watch like a like 10 minutes is good in a day you know don't don't doom scroll for like 3 hours you know that's just going to ruin your dopamine system um uh, install good habits like exercise you know workout you know um uh workout like eat good uh you know surround yourself with smart ambitious people you know watch the content you consume you know like a, um i think if you're already listening to this i think it's a good start right you you, you start thinking and like uh, seeing what other people like you can do, you know, so definitely check out, you know, Gary's Twitter or my Twitter, you know, <laughs> I think follow other like inspiring people um, and see what they do. Because at the end of the day, we're all humans. Like there's not much difference between you and, you know, uh, a, a CEO in, in Silicon Valley, actually. Um, you could be like that too, given enough time, enough resources, and enough planning. It might not be you. You might not be Elon Musk tomorrow, but in twenty years, you could be. You know, um, or maybe if you maybe if you can't, but like you can pl you can set it up for your kids, which is great too. I think a lot of people always focus on like the Jeff Bezos or like the Elon Musk, but they don't realize that like their parents also set up things really well. You know, I think we should appreciate the parents and the grandparents too. Like it's sometimes it's not just one generation thing. Like my success is not just 
my own hard work, but there's already a lot of careful planning and hard work done by my parents and my grandparents. And I think um, I got far, but again, there are people um, that's way further too, you know, I think, I think instead of like criticizing other people, why don't we learn from them, you know, and try to be better, uh, better person, better parents, all that. And um, think global, you know, the world is bigger than Indonesia. I think a lot of people, a lot of Indonesian kids, they just kind of like want to go to like the best um, thing in Indonesia or like want to be like the best petroleum engineer in Indonesia and then they forget like Indonesia is a small corner of the world like <laughs> the world is huge, is huge and there's 7 billion people out there I think it's closing to 8 now so think think global don't just stuck in Indonesia try try to talk to people online in you know, in Japan, in Russia, in the United States, in London, in Australia, you'd be surprised how much you can learn from them, you know, and go out of your com comfort zone. I think try to do extraordinary things or go to extraordinary places, you know. You never know how much you could go if you just stay at home, you know. Sometimes, you just have to take that risk. Like, you know, you know, our ancestors were, were, were Palaut, you know, they're, they're sailors. They, they take risks going to one island to another. They might have died in the process, right? So I see it like that too. Like, there's failures, but you shouldn't be afraid of them. Um, give it your best shot. Like, at first, I didn't know I could get into the United States too, but here we are, right? You just figuring it out one at a time, modal than cool, right? Um, you can get far by by that, and um, and um, yeah, I think those are like general advice. But I guess I guess a more practical advice would be, you know, learn English. I think it's a it's a good practical advice because the, it's such a global language if you know english you can get access to a lot of knowledge that's out there globally you know consume good content um uh like again like uh, read books and follow other inspiring people um, um i think build skill that is in demand by society you know learn how to do hard things that help a lot of people um and maybe and also like get mentorship right like i think i i um i'm lucky to met my advisor and i learned a lot in in research but also like in 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 startups um you know they introduced me to a lot of like investors and like uh like legal um you know mentors are really helpful and um uh, you should try to find mentors and and these days i also try to mentor young indonesians from for uh, using my dev agency in indonesia so um i think i haven't talked about it but like uh i run this uh, I, I started this agency but i think uh, when i was back in indonesia i started this agency called tka.co.id and what we do is we take uh like young talented uh computer science students who or or like junior engineers who wants to um take on global projects you know so if you're still in high school and college and and you uh, you're interested in computer science and and software development um definitely uh, reach out to us because when I was when I was in Indonesia I started I, I talked to a lot of um, the engineers and the designers and I realized hey like like Indonesian kids are smart they're like me you know we're, we're smart um, we're not like idiots compared to 
you know, Europeans or like Americans. We just don't have the 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 guidance, the culture, you know, the the opportunity, you know, the difference between me when I was twenty one year old and like some some Indonesian kid when they're twenty one is like I am lucky that I could intern at PayPal or Yahoo or Snapchat, right? And I learned the standards of Silicon Valley, but these kids, maybe they're not so lucky. Um, so I realized, hey, as a person that I would have a lot of uh, connections and, and right now I don't do it myself because uh, I started it, but I'm mostly right now it's run by my sister uh the the, de- the development agency um but i noticed like hey there's a global client who wants to get uh software done in the form of like mobile apps or like websites and all that kind of stuff but in in indonesia there's a lot of young talents who are smart but they don't have like the training so we realize we built this agency such that it trains young Indonesian talents to be Silicon Valley great because of uh, our teaching and our mentorship. And we uh, solve clients from United States, Canada, Australia, and, and, um, you know, and Europe. And um, I think it, it, it's been, it's been a win, win, win for everyone um it's a mentorship and also like we try to pay you know very good uh salary um in indonesia and my hope is to that um you know we we one we bring the uh we solve global clients problem with indonesian talent uh so global people are more aware of Indonesian talents. Um, I think right now the most common one is like India. You know, Indian t- outsourcing company is very famous in Silicon Valley. But I I think we're we're not that dumb compared to Indians. We're we're smart too. Uh, they're like distant cousin. Um, uh, so bringing that branding but also like training this young Indonesians to be like global talents so i hope after they're done interning or like working with us later on they could you know find jobs across the world so i think like going back to the questions like what are the advices you know practical advice would be like learn english consume good content find uh mentorship and and a good place and surround yourself with people that grows and um yeah i think that's a good start it's a journey but i think that's a good start yeah it's uh, amazing advice man even i'm pumped now <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 man i think i think i think that's the yeah let's go i mean that's the cool thing about um you know having having a lot of friends who are who are like um smart and ambitious and i'm and i'm i really think what you're doing here is awesome gary you know like, you know, let me know how, what else I could help, you know? Absolutely. Um, yeah. All right. We, 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 need, we need to put Indonesians in the global stage. Yeah, you got to put them on the map. Yeah, let's stop bickering with, you know, politics in Indo. Like we we got <laughs> we gotta provide, you know, products and services that that is known uh in the global market that's what we should do i think all right sounds good all right thank you so much risky for your time this is an amazing amazing episode no worries gary i i really enjoyed the time chatting with you as always so yeah thank you so much thank you all right thanks risky bye Have a good one, man. Bye.